show we have the amazing and talented Michelle Chalmers with us um, speaking to us about all her books. So Michelle, please tell us that you have published um, quite a few books. So tell us a little bit about each of them. Sure, absolutely. And thank you, Rama, for having me. So good to see you and be with you. I have um, self-published um, four books uh, children's books. And um, my first book came out, uh, The Skin on My Chin. And that book came out in 2013. I was um, looking for books uh, to speak and talk and, and, and engage with my children. Um, I had two boys um, um, who were probably let's see, was how many years ago was that? But they were probably like eight or nine years old. And, you know, whenever as parents, you want to have conversations with your children and you're not really sure how to have those conversations, usually you go find a book, right? Like, and try to engage and share and keep your children's attention. You know, you see so many books um, when you want to do anything, um, potty training, um, you know, um, sharing those kind of things. There's so many great books that you can um, sit down with your child. There's pictures, and you can engage in a conversation. Well, I wanted to have a conversation about skin color and um, what skin is, what skin isn't, mm -hmm. um, because um, as a white woman raising children of color, uh, my husband identifies as black. And so our children are uh, white and black. And I wanted to engage with them about why their skin color was different than mine and their dad's and sort of how that all worked. And, um, and there just wasn't anything out there at the time. And, you know, I would go to the library and say, you know, do you have books? You know, this is what I want to talk to. And they would give me like bud buddy not buddy or you know it was like the only book they had about a little black boy um and i was like okay seriously this is this is all you have so luckily so much has changed since 2013 but um at that time i really i wanted to engage and then i realized that i wanted to have um their white friends' parents engage with conversations, um, you know, um, with their children. So I looked into, um, you know, how do you publish a book and, and all of that, and it was pretty complicated. You know, here I am, you know, full-time mom and, and, you know, just trying to, you know, obviously read a book to my child. So with the time and energy that I did have and just the knowledge and know-how, I started to look and found this platform on Amazon um, that allowed you to create your own book, self-publish. You could upload it to Amazon, literally was $25. And it wasn't even $25 if you wanted just to stay within the country, but if you wanted to have your books available um, outside of the country, you could add, you know, it was $25 fee. So I was like, wow, this is great. And there was no, um, you know, the platform was really easy to use. You go on there. Uh, it was create space is what they called it uh, then. I think it's KPS or something. They changed the name of it now, but we can try to find the link for everybody. Cause if you want to write a book, you can write a book. So, um, and go do it. And um, so, yeah, so I wrote the skin on my chin First, that's a rhyming picture book. And again, I'm not an illustrator. I wasn't sure really what to do. Uh, so I um, took pictures of um, my kids and my nieces and my nephews, and my friends, and my friends' kids, and, uh, and invited everybody to share pictures because I wanted um, a multicultural um you know, faces and also um, faces of children with um, other abilities and children 
um, you know, again, cultural differences, ethnic differences. And uh, so I tried to fill the book with as many of um, uh, human differences that, that we see um, for children and had a conversation about um, what skin is and what skin isn't. And so it's a book appropriate, you know, for infants, you know, uh, where I've read the book um, to sixth graders, but it is rhyming. It is, um, that's what's the skin on my chin. Right. And so we, we try to rhyme throughout the book. So that was my first book. And, you know, again, as a full-time mom, I didn't really do a lot of promoting. I just sort of let it happen organically, shared it with friends and family and a lot of my kids' teachers. Uh, I would give them the books, give the library the book. And, um, and so I started to engage with some classroom teachers and going into classrooms and reading the book uh, to kids and really opening up the conversation about what is skin? you know, um, and what isn't skin? Does skin color, um, you know, part of the book talks about, you know, skin doesn't make you fast, it doesn't make you funny, it doesn't make you smart. Um, and, you know, those are real questions and things that stereotypes right. that children internalize and children believe that if they see, um, you know, basketball players, most of the basketball players now in our country are of African descent or black or African American. And so you make these assumptions, you know, um, like they're which all is, yes, and, right. and which is interesting is that when basketball started in this country, it was all Jewish people, um, and then sort of evolved. And now, you know, it's, and so people, um, you know, internalize these stereotypes and believe that there is more truth to them. Now, stereotypes, some of that stereotypes are true, but they're not true for everyone. Right. And that's an important point to be able to engage with children. So that's what I was doing is hoping that not only my book would engage my children about some critical thinking about really pushing, you know, does, you know, because you can run fast and you have brown skin, does that really Correct. matter? in right. terms of, you know, is there really a correlation there, right? And no, there is not. Right. Um, so, and again, you have to be really specific with children and really point this out. And it, it's not something that you can just assume that children can understand critically in their mind because they're so concrete in their thinking. So- But it's easier, I, it's easier to connect the dots in hindsight than it is in the moment for even for adults. And Absolutely. So, right. There's and and again, there's a lot. You know, even when I wrote the book, um, you know, I had someone close to me say, "I thought black people had a special muscle in their leg that made them run faster." And uh, no, and I was like, really, yeah, yeah, there was actually that. You know, um, non-science uh, was wow. going around for a really long time, the eugenics movement and trying right. to find out why Jesse Owens was the fastest man in the world when clearly that was not supposed to happen. So, um, wow. you know, they, again, there's just so much history and so right. many stories and so many things that we don't engage with children to talk about and that we need to. Right. So that and was I sort of the impetus for the right. first book. And I think it was genius on your part to um, boil that down into the skin on my chin. Yeah, that and a little historical perspective down to um, you know make it really hit home and understandable for kids and for yeah. adults. I'm, I assume too, because you know you read that story to your children and it makes adults wonder. Yes. Right. Yes, absolutely. And, absolutely. and, what, and what is your second book about? Yeah, so the second book that I had written was um, The Story of Metco. So growing up in Wellesley, um, I was very familiar with the Metco program um, as when I was in high school 35 years ago. And, um, but I never really knew what it was. I didn't really understand it. I, I knew, oh, those are Metco kids. Um, you know, you certainly noticed that they were black. Um, you know that they didn't live in the town, 
but no one ever had conversations about it. And so I remember saying to my kids one time, do your kids, do your teachers talk to you about what MECO is? Like, do you know what the MECO program is? And both my boys said, no. And they were in like sixth or seventh grade at the time. Right. And I said, so you're telling me you've been in Wellesley Public Schools <laughs> since kindergarten and no one has ever told you what the MECO program is. Like you have no idea right. why these black and brown children are getting off a bus from Boston and sitting with you and going to school with you. Right. No. And, you know, when I dropped my boys off at Wellesley Public Schools for the first time, um, I was told by the principal, um, you know, don't worry, I'll make sure your boys don't go home on the Metco bus. So there was a clear disconnect um, sure. that I had always noticed and understood and, um, and thought that how is it that no one has written a book for children to understand what the MECO program is. And so I went to Dr. Jean McGuire, who was the MECO uh, executive director at the time. She had been the director for like 35 years, went to Dr. Jean and, and asked her permission, you know, is this okay? First of all, as a white lady, you know, and you know, I'm just a parent. Yes, I'm a, um, a family friend in the MECO program in Wellesley and I'm, you know, on the board for Friends of Wellesley Metco. Um, but I really want to write a book and I want to write a book in the perspective of a teacher having a conversation with children um, about the Metco program. So it would model sort of what that could look like and how teachers should be engaging um, all 38 towns that the Metco program exists in Massachusetts um, every year you should be talking to children about this program so we understand. And, um, and she was like, I can't believe nobody's done it, you know, before, go for it. Nice. And um, yeah, so I uh, created that book again. I tried to create the illustrations and made them uh, sort of, um, um, sort of like cartoon comics kind of a thing. And uh, <laughs> And so I shared a little bit of the history. I shared a little bit about Ruby Bridges and about school segregation and that the MECO program is a desegregation program that, um, you know, that the history of um, black children not being allowed to attend uh, schools with white children. Again, this is something that children need to understand. And, um, and I'll, you know, when I would, talk to children or read the story um, to kids, kids were really surprised, you know, they sort of thought, well, didn't Martin Luther King end that? Like that didn't, like that's, that's not a thing. Um, and so it was really one of those things that again, you engage in these conversations with children, they do know, they do understand. And I think we make a mistake. And sometimes I think that we don't, as parents choose to talk with our children about these issues, not because we don't think our children can understand, but because we are so fearful and might not have the right information. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I model um, in all of the schools that I've gone to and read this book um, and coordinated with a lot of the Metco coordinators across Massachusetts who invited me to come to the school and read the book to their entire first grade, their entire second grade. Mm -hmm. A lot of the teachers, you know, again, just modeling how you have these conversations that you don't need to have all the answers for kids, right? right? We don't have all the answers and, and how to model that um, to gain more information, ask, you know, leading questions or pertinent questions for kids to, you know, help to expand on, um, the knowledge that we might not have and that we need to have. So, so that, um, you know, it wasn't um, totally received um, by everyone. So it was sort of interesting. Um, you know, unfortunately, I thought that, um, you know, maybe it would be something that could be done in the school systems. But I had worked with some um, uh, Deb Ward and some other people at MECO 
who were really trying to, um, you know, to get the book into the schools and uh, which I think um, is just a really important thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was the second book. Mm -hmm. And the third book was um, I Am You Are. And this book I um, made again with uh, photos of uh, beautiful black and brown boys. And so I, I focused on young boys um, because of what was happening, what we saw with Tamir Rice, what we saw with Trayvon Martin, what we were seeing with um, just the horrific um, killing of young black boys and black boys being stereotyped as cute until they're five and then they are criminals. They are evil. There's something wrong with them. Um, it is devastating to me, absolutely devastating. And um, I just said, we have to engage our young black and brown boys to know how beautiful they are, how wonderful they are. And we have to do that just like, you know, we all know um, how oppression works and how damaging words can be. And you hear one damaging, you know, remark or comment or criticism that it takes what 10 um, positive uh, words of reinforcement and love to be able to counteract that one. And so I said, you know, how can I use you know, this platform and my privilege to be able to put forth a book that's filled with beautiful pictures of black and brown boys and to share how beautiful they are, how awesome they are, how fantastic they are. So the book is really um, just an opportunity to sit with your child and read, I am beautiful, you are beautiful. I am wonderful, you are wonderful. And so the book goes through with I am, you are, um, through beautiful pictures of, of little boys and, um, and just all the ways that, uh, that they show up in the world to, again, constantly um, enforce, reinforce um, their beauty, um, their humanity, um, and the love that we need to show for them um, because of how um, damaged that they are in this society. I have seen that um, in my own children mm -hmm. and um, it has really speared me to be um, a racial justice educator um, and strive to be anti-racist and try to um, engage um, with people, whoever will talk with me <laughs> and engage around race and racism, because this oppression is, is so damaging to our children and not just to our black and brown children, but to our white children um, also. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just felt that it was um, an important opportunity, um, again, for um, black moms, black dads, um, people who are raising black and brown children um, to really engage their sons and remind them about how wonderful they are. Uh, because all the world around them and the, and the media and the images um, really tell them the opposite. And mm -hmm. you internalize that right. and it's very, very damaging. So that was um, my third book. Right. And the fourth one, we uh, is one that I just really, really love. And that one is called Vitamin D and Me, How Humans Outsmarted the Sun. And this was inspired by Dr. Nina Jablonski, who wrote In Living Color. She is an anthropologist out of Penn, uh, UPenn or Penn State. I always get those two confused. I think it's UPenn. Sorry, Dr. Jablonski, uh, but she did an amazing TED Talk. Mm -hmm. And I believe if you, if you Google uh, TED Talk Nina, Nina Jablonski, um, you know, skin, evolution of skin, um, that TED Talk will come up. Change my world. Mm -hmm. I literally had no idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I watched the TED Talk and 
it was part of um, media and video that I now use in my white people challenging racism workshops that I facilitate because it's so vital for us to understand how our skin color has evolved since we, uh, some of us walked out of Africa, right? So just understanding, you know, um, those facts as an adult, right. um, it made sense to me that we need to tell children this very early. If we are able to engage with children at a young age before stereotypes and racism is embedded into them, right? Because by the time a child is in third grade, their racial identity is fixed. So that means we have to start way before third grade, engaging in these conversations and really building their truth, building with facts, building with science, building with conversation, mm -hmm. uh, love and understanding about fairness and peace. So having these conversations early, I think are truly, truly important. So I took her um, TED talk um, and created a children's book based on her research and her information. And uh, there's actually an email in my book at the end that I had, um, that she sent back to me after I sent her a book and told her uh, that she was my inspiration for it. She was thrilled. And uh, so it was really, really exciting for me to have that. And it's in um, one of the last pages of the book. So that story is, how you know how we all got our skin color or get our skin color from our ancestry and then all the way back uh hundreds of thousands of years when we were all uh and lived in africa and all had dark skin and tight curly hair and how we all showed up so it really is um a great opportunity to um to have that conversation with children i'm surprised and actually, maybe I'm not surprised that there's so many parents that that really don't know, because I didn't know. I really didn't know um, until I learned this. So, um, so yeah, so that book is um, one of my favorites right now, because I think it's a way to really um, have conversations with children at a foundational level right it's like oh my kids are too young to talk about race and and racism and white supremacy. Where do I start. Well, you start with the basics of understanding. But color is, right? yeah. color is one of the fundamental things that kids notice. They do. And a lot of parents think they don't. A lot of parents think that children do not see color. Please don't say that anymore. Please don't believe that anymore because they learn, they learn primary colors in kindergarten. So and that's right. And we're so excited. My child knows red and blue, but right. they don't see brown. Right. It's like, I'm always like, okay, really? Right. Um, you know, and most parents are like, well, you know what I mean? They, and I said, you mean that they don't place value on skin color difference? Okay, that's a whole different conversation, right. but they do see color. Right. And if you don't speak to them, they will begin placing value right. on skin color differences, okay? And devaluing certain colors. Right. So we do need to engage in these conversations. Um, you know, in a lot of the talks that I give to parents, I make the analogy of talking about sex. That for some, you know, we can talk about it now. Like, can you imagine that there were parents who did not talk to their children about sex? Like, what were they thinking? How could you ever think that your child is going to understand the language, being able to make good choices, maybe, you know, choose not to have sex if you don't talk to them about it, right? Like, it just seems so antithetical now. Like, how how in the world was that ever, oh yeah, we don't want our children, you know, to have sex or to have unprotected sex or, but we're not going to talk to them about it. So with that same analogy, how in the world do you expect children not to internalize racism, internalize the stereotypes, to make good choices, to not um, fill their ideas and, and minds with racist thoughts and ideas if we don't talk about it. Right, I think 
humans we expect their children to be epiphytes like orchids. We just derive um, knowledge out of thin air. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, okay. and let's see how that works for people. Yeah, it really, it doesn't. And I think we have to be honest with that within ourselves. We have to educate ourselves and we have to stop denying that these um, really just social ills, um, evil is right. not affecting our children because it is. Right. Uh, no matter who you are, no matter how much money you have, no right. matter where you live, right. um, this stuff is impacting your children, your children's lives, their relationships, their ability to connect, um, their ability to understand the world around them. And as parents, I think it's very important that we understand our responsibility and as teachers, um, that we have an enormous responsibility for children um, to be able to think critically and to be able to connect to anyone around them and understand um, human differences and what a blessing and, and how amazing it can be um, you know, to have that understanding and that knowledge for sure. And speaking of the um, understanding and knowledge um, and the, um, the joy of it, um, you recently uh, shared your book, um, Vitamin D and Me, at the recent World of Wellesley's Martin Luther King Day program. And you read it to a whole bunch of kids for the kids program that they had. So, and how did that go? Describe that and how that, how that went for you and what was the takeaway? Yeah, absolutely. That was very, very fun. Um, you know, I have been engaging with children online now uh, since, you know, COVID and trying to uh, provide opportunities as much as I can. We can't stop the learning. We can't stop engaging. And so this platform has worked really well. Mm -hmm. I'm able to uh, show my book on the screen and sharing my screen and having, um, you know, children engage that way. It's amazing how children are so well-versed on the computer. They know Zoom probably better than most parents. And so Wilder Wellesley was celebrating uh, Martin Luther King Day yesterday. And so I offered uh, and volunteered my time to um, read my book to the children. And we had probably at least 75, <laughs> 75 children, at least it looked like um, just so many beautiful faces. And, and they were so amazing. They listened so intently. Um, they all said they loved the book and it was amazing when we opened it up to questions, which is my favorite part, you know, it's just amazing how you see the light bulb go off for a lot of kids. Like I've never thought about that. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that. And then they start to make connections. They start to think critically about the sun. Why is the sun more powerful in some places than other places? Why is it that my skin turns browner? Um, why do my skin burn in the sun? You know, so it's really a, a, an amazing conversation, not just about science and about human evolution, but again, how we show up in the world, how our differences uh, and our similarities um, really sort of, you know, coalesce there. And children can understand that they do have the capacity um, to question. And I think it's important to you know, talk to children every year, you know, read this book every year, because certain things might go over a child's head. And then next year, it's going to totally plant in. But hearing these repetitive messages over and over and over again, will they will begin to formulate that into a better understanding to where they now can articulate that. And when someone says, oh, well, you know, you have dark skin or, you know, your skin is dark and I don't, you know, I don't want to be friends with you. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want to touch you. Does your, you know, all of these things, uh, microaggressions that, that happen every day that children say because they really just don't know right. and they don't understand. They're not trying to be evil or mean. Um, they're just confused and might be fearful. So you having these conversations, you empower your children now speak up. You're like, you know what? The child, you know, this child does have darker skin. They have more melanin than we do. 
but our skin is the same. They just have, you know, better protection from the sun than, than we do. And do you know that we used to all have dark brown skin like, like him or her? So you can engage in these conversations and really help children um, to connect. Because what happens is, is your children do not have this information and they don't understand human difference and specifically skin color, then they do begin to say these things to other children. And those friendships fracture and they're very hard to get back. And so now if you notice that all, that your children only are friends with people that look like them, understand that that happens. <laughs> because we do not talk to our children about, about difference, about human difference. And, um, you know, I just, just have so many stories with my own children and, um, and their relationships um, with white people, specifically white children, again, just not understanding um, and making comments um, and just not seeing my children for who they are. Um, and that's, Again, as a child, who wants to be friends with someone who doesn't let you be your authentic self, that doesn't understand how you walk the world? Um, you know, that empathy and compassion is just missing, you know, where, you know, my older son stopped having any white friends after sixth grade. Um, so that's a loss. That's a loss to him and it's a loss to, to the white children in, in Wellesley. I think that, uh, you know, um, it's, it's just a shame. And again, I hope that parents, white parents specifically understand you have to have these conversations if you want your children to understand the world around them and share the values that you have. And if you have these values, make sure your children know that and understand that and get my books. It'll help you to engage in the conversation. I show you how to have the conversation. I have questions in the back, uh, ways to engage. Uh, so awesome. I hope it does help for parents. That sounds super helpful. It was just, your comments just reminded me of a, a German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, who's, who claimed, or his philosophy was essentially that um, most people um, have 99% um, of um um, their thoughts and ideology as to, you know, the way the world works and who they are and how they perceive things um, given to them from either their parents or the environmental circumstances they grew up in. So there's, there's probably, he says, there's probably less than 1% of anything in a human being that originated from themselves um, without any influence, external influence. So yeah. it's, it's very interesting. It it's is very interesting, interesting to think about. So yeah. thank you, Michelle. This has been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank awesome. you, Rama. It's and, always uh, fun to be with you. And, and please check in again and let us know um, how the book readings are going and give us feedback and some anecdotal stories. Yes, and definitely share the upcoming event on January 31st in Needham that's open to everyone. Uh, that I believe it's the Needham Public Library that is um, sponsoring the program. And I'd be, love to have people join. Perfect. Thank you again.